So yeah, thank you so much for coming to our If Not You Who Zoom talk. Uh, as I say, it's fantastic to see so many people here. And we're thrilled also to be sharing this event as Just Our Foil uh, with Extinction Rebellion, Animal Rising, uh, and guests Chris Packham and Peter, a medical researcher from Gambia, who's going to be here to, to discuss the global impact of the climate crisis. So in tonight's event, we're going to be hearing from each of our speakers, getting an overview of who they are, what the big one is, why we're doing it, why it's so important, how each group is going to be getting involved, and most crucially, how you can get involved. We will be finishing tonight's event with a Q&A, so you'll be able to post your questions into the chat and I'll direct them to any one of the speakers from tonight. Uh, so if that all sounds good, we'll kick off. Um, I'm just going to start by introducing myself. So I'm Anna Holland. Uh, you may recognize me from last October when I threw tomato soup at Van Gogh sunflowers alongside Phoebe, who you'll be hearing from in just a little bit. Um, I've been involved in the climate movement since 2019, when I snuck out of school to attend a school strike in Manchester. And I ended up giving an impromptu speech to over 3000 people. And since then, I've dedicated all of my time and energy to fighting back against our criminal government's disregard for human life. And in the past year, my action has taken the form of civil disobedience with Just Stop Oil. Until our demand of no new oil is met, I promise you'll all be seeing a lot more of me on the streets. So at this point, we are probably all aware that the climate science is undeniable. With scientists delivering the final warning on the climate crisis, that we must act now or it's too late. Once again, the latest IPCC report has undoubtedly demonstrated that only swift and drastic action can avert irrevocable damage to the world. This situation has been described as an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership by the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. And the IPCC finds that there is a more than 50% chance that global temperature rise will reach or surpass 1.5 degrees between 2021 and 2040 across studied scenarios and under a high emissions pathway. More specifically, the world may hit this threshold even sooner, between 2018 and 2037. And climate change has also slowed improvements in agricultural productivity in middle and low altitudes, latitudes. With crop productivity growth shrinking by a third in Africa since 1961, and since 2008, extreme floods and storms forced over 20 million people from their homes every single year. And today, between 3.3 billion and 3.6 billion people live in countries but are highly vulnerable to climate impacts, with global hotspots concentrated in the Arctic, Central and South America, small island developing states, South Asia, and much of Sub-Saharan Africa. Across many countries in, this, in these regions, conflict, existing inequalities, and development challenges not only heighten sensitivity to climate hazards, but also limit communities' capacity to adapt. Mortality from storms, floods and droughts, for instance, was 15 times higher in countries with high vulnerability to climate change than in those with very low vulnerability from the decade between 2010 and 2020. I think it's really important that we highlight these facts and findings to underline the urgency of the situation. But please note that tonight we are focusing on what we can do. Most importantly, Tonight's event is here to highlight just how essential it is that we build a collective power, that we come together and create such a force in our multitude that those in power will have no other choice but to listen. To do this, we need all of us. And as I've said, there will also be a Q&A at the end. So please remember any questions uh, you may have, uh, save those of the speakers uh, at that point. So now to begin the conversation, we are thrilled to introduce our first speaker, Blythe, an activist from Extinction Rebellion who's been working on the big one. And she's here to give an overview of the big one, the reason we're all here tonight. So please, Blythe, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, as Anna said, I'm Blythe. 
I am one of the many, many people in Extinction Rebellion who have been working in preparation for the big one. Um, I'm actually in the space we're working in right now, so I apologize for any background noise. It's a big echoey warehouse. Um, I have, so I've been involved in civil disobedience and direct action for the climate since 2019. I joined out of a deep sense of anger and despair um, with those in power. Uh, who have known, as we know, for decades about the risks of climate, the climate crisis. Um, because since before I was born, governments have been meeting to discuss the environment as far back as 1968. Um, there have been 27 climate conferences of world leaders spread over my lifetime. And Men, and in all that time, things have just got much, much worse. And Anna did just spell that out for you um, in much more detail. So to launch into what you can do, um, the big one is a massive protest happening from Friday to Monday this weekend. So to give you a bit of background, um, uh, after um, at the start of this year, Extinction Rebellion, announced we quit and what did we mean by that what we meant was we were going to pause public disruption and switch to only disrupting the pillars of power so in the run-up to the big one we targeted the justice system the finance system the fossil fuel industry and the media and in the meantime uh, extinction rebellions relationships team worked incredibly hard to reach out to every single possible group they could think of to come along to the big one and support and grow the numbers. Because um, we'd seen that after the success of 2019, it started to look like numbers were flatlining. So it became really apparent that we need to somehow grow those numbers to, and to reach a way wider range of people to become much more open and diverse and, um, and open up to people who previously may have felt nervous to join a climate movement. So um, as a result of that massive push, we've managed to get hundreds of organizations to come along. So as well as JSO and Animal Rising, we've got NGOs like Greenpeace, um, groups like War on Want, trade unions like the PCS Union and Unite, and even um, some companies like Patagonia and Fairtrade who are all participating. Um, so we've, so that's, that's added up to quite a few hundred groups. Um, and on Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday, about 50 of these groups submitted two collective demands to the government. Number one, was to stop the search for new fossil fuels immediately in a transition towards reparatory justice. And the second demand is to set up emergency citizens assemblies to let the people decide to end the fossil fuel era quickly and fairly, because of, as we've seen, those in power have proved time and time again that they are incapable. So, um, with these demands, we issued the government an ultimatum. They have till Monday at 5 p.m. to agree to enter negotiations around these two demands. If they do not uh, give a response by Monday at 5 p.m., we will all step up our campaigns and invite everyone attending the big one to step up together and work towards a coalition unprecedented in size to fight against this issue, which is clearly the biggest issue humanity has ever faced. So that's the background. And what's happening over those four days? There will be several marches on Friday and Monday. They will, everyone will be grouped outside uh, government departments, picketing them with the demands. And um, there'll be all sorts of different things going on at every single one of those pickets on Friday and Monday. Um, every day at 3 p.m. till 4.30 p.m., there will be mass assemblies um, at which everyone is invited to attend to deliberate together on what they will do next to step it up. And then on the Monday, we will all gather en masse around Parliament to find out what their response is to the demands. 
are they willing to say whether they will enter negotiations or not? And if not, we will have spent the four days deciding what to do next. And this may be completely different for different people. So we are offering um, people three broad pathways to choose from throughout the uh, four days and especially on the Monday. And these three pathways are picket, which is stand in solidarity with workers, to organize locally, connecting and mobilizing in communities, and disobey, which would be direct action and civil disobedience. And, um, and then there will also be many incredible spe speakers, performances, um, music, like there's a rave on one of the days, the Saturday, it's a biodiversity theme. There'll be a big march. There'll be all sorts of things around biodiversity loss. And then after all this huge accumulation of events, after the big, big one, um, if the government has not responded, if or when the government has not responded, because um, we do not have hugely high hopes they will, um, seeing as they haven't done anything for decades, um, then after the big one, we will bring all the groups that attended around the table and decide how we can work together to step it up and grow an even bigger coalition. Um, and so thanks everyone for coming along. And if you're interested in going to the big one, the best place to go for information is the Extinction Rebellion website. And from there, you'll be able to click on um, the big one at the top of the website. And there's the program, there's all the different things you can do. You can sign up to volunteer and help. Um, it's not too last minute and or otherwise you just turn up on the day, there'll be welcome desks and hopefully they'll be guiding, they'll guide you to where to go. So that's me. I'll pass on to the next speaker. Thank you so much for that, Bly. Um, next we'll be hearing from Animal Rising uh, with Olaf Hochlin, uh, who has a background in children's nursing and has been on the leadership team in Animal Rising for the past two years. Uh, she is here with us tonight to explain a bit about who Animal Rising is and what they're currently up to and how they're going to be involved in the big one. So please go ahead, Orla. Hi everyone, um, I'm Orla. I am a volunteer with Animal Rising. Um, Animal Rising is a group that started in 2019 kind of as a um, sister movement of Extinction Rebellion. Um, but are very much our own kind of movement now and we've transitioned to the name um, Animal Rising. You may have seen us at the weekend um, disrupting the Grand National and we're taking these actions to our, our main focus is to shine a spotlight on the way that we're treating animals um, in the UK and we know that the way that we're treating animals is having an immense um, impact on biodiversity and on nature and so we believe that if we can have a really public conversation about the way that we're treating animals that we can um, hopefully not only restore our relationship with the natural world but also um, mitigate these huge impacts of the climate crisis. Um, a small bit of, of background on the group so we're primarily uh, involved in direct action as you saw with the Grand National um, but we also have other campaigns we have a plant-based universities campaign where we're um, helping universities to transition to fully plant-based and we've had several wins already um, very exciting and we also have a plant-based councils um, team that campaign um, towards local councils such as like the Oxford um, council are now uh, fully plant-based um, so we do do a bit of a range of things but obviously our primary action is direct action um, a small bit of background on um, what we have coming up and why we're doing what we're doing um, so as we know, there's a lot of action towards fossil fuels in the UK um, and around the world, but we think there's there's two huge um, pillars going on here with the climate crisis. We know that meat and dairy are also a leading cause of, of emissions, um, but they're also an immense, um, immense, um, I guess, land use um, issue. We know that um, half of the land in the UK is used for meat and dairy. And if we can transition away from plant-based meats, um, or if we can transition away from meat and dairy um, towards a plant-based food system, one of the largest studies from a man called uh, Joseph Poor um, uh, from Oxford University has shown that we could rewild vast amounts of land. We know that the UK at the moment is one of the most deforested countries um, in the whole of Europe. And so if we can reforest, we can draw down huge amounts of carbon um, as well. And so that's what we're really about. Um, we're about creating change, not only for the individual animals. We know that we're killing a billion animals a year. Um, in the UK and 85% of those are factory farmed um, 
And so we're, we're one of the most recent studies that I find really shocking is if we continue fishing our oceans at the rate we are, um, then we will end up with fishless oceans as early as 2050. And so this biodiversity issue is absolutely immense and we know it goes hand in hand with the climate crisis. And if we really want to resolve the climate crisis, um, we need to be um, having solutions that are that are nature first. Um, so um, we have a huge summer coming up. We have a summer of animal rising where we'll be taking direct action, um, trying to raise awareness and create this public conversation about the use of animals and how we can um, transition away from that towards a safer, more sustainable food system. Um, so we'll be do doing other things like the horse racing um, action that we had at the weekend. We'll be doing more of those and we'll also be doing um, op open rescues of animals where we'll be bringing animals away from um, factory farms um, and slaughterhouses into safety. Um, and we'll also be at the big one um, this weekend, very excited to be there. Um, we have uh, a nice program if anyone would like to come and meet us, come and speak with us. Um, on Friday, we're going to be at the People's um, Picket outside DEFRA. Um, we have a new logo and new banners and everything, so it will be very easy to recognize. Um, we're like kind of pink in color and we have this kind of a symbol um, on our banners. It's like an upside down A. So do come and say hi if you see us. Um, on Saturday, we will be um, at the Nature Rally and the Biodiversity March. Um, and again, we'll have loads and loads of flags with us. So come and say hello. On Sunday, we have a day of outreach um, at the around the marathon, um, trying to raise awareness about this conversation that we're trying to have. And then on um, Monday, we will be um, joining the Fossil Fuel March because we're very, um, very much pro uh, extinction rebellion and just up oil and their demands of moving away from fossil fuels because um, we're all really in this this huge fight together. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much me. Thank you so much for that, Ola. Um, next up, we're going to be hearing from my best friend and partner in crime, literally, Phoebe Plummer. Uh, Phoebe has recently become a central and recognisable figure within the Just Off Oil campaign after they threw tomato soup at Van Gogh's sunflowers. Uh, they have also been keen spreading the demands of Just Off Oil. They've put their civil liberty on the line, but has been consistent in stating that they are not a criminal, they're just a scared kid trying to fight for their future. So with that, Phoebe, take it away. Hi. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Phoebe. I'm 21 and I'm a supporter of Just Stop Oil. And Just Stop Oil is a coalition of ordinary people. And we're demanding that the UK government ends all new fossil fuel projects and licences. So this is a basic yet crucial demand. And it simply echoes the advice spelled out by the United Nations, the International Energy Agency and the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change. But we're done asking politely. Now we're demanding a right to life on Earth. We all know the climate science and the long and short of it is if we don't act now, we're fucked. The politicians have been bribed. They won't save us. The media has been bribed. They won't tell us the truth. It's up to us now, ordinary people, to force the change we so desperately need. And this change won't come about from signing petitions, writing to our MPs, holding placards on the side of the road. We've all learned the hard way that these things are too easily ignored. Directly stopping the flow of oil can't be. Throwing soup on a painting can't be. Shutting down the M25 can't be. And I'm fed up of being ignored when it's my future that's at stake. We know the rapid social change must come from civil resistance, something history has proved effective time and time again. Women did not get the vote by voting on it. Instead, the suffragettes slashed paintings. They smashed shop windows. They disrupted business as usual, and they demanded the right to vote. In just over a year since Just Stop Oil started its campaign, of blocking oil infrastructure, stopping traffic, and disrupting cultural events, we've had huge wins. All major political parties, other than the zombie Tories, have adopted our demand. We've seen major banks, HSBC, Lloyds, and NatWest, all agree to stop investing in new fossil fuels. Our actions have received huge publicity, forcing the greatest existential threat to human life to the forefront of public consciousness. But we're not done, and we won't stop until we win. But we still need more people to join us. We won't win this until we wake up and realise it's up to us. 
to take us off what the United Nations has called a highway to climate hell. It's why we need everyone on the streets of the big one this weekend. Everyone with any love, empathy and common sense needs to be there. Because if we don't force change now, we're accepting a future filled with storms, wildfires, floods, drought, crop failure, famine and war. Because if we don't force change now, we're condoning a government that is actively planning the deaths of hundreds of millions of people. Often I've heard people talk about a moment when they first became aware of the climate crisis, but being 21, most of my life I've heard people talking about it. A bigger realization for me was that I had to be the one to do something about it. That was when I looked at the world around me and just saw so much suffering, especially in the global south. People are dying. Children are starving. Families are fleeing their homes. All this injustice and so much of it preventable. I realise that there's a small number of wealthy elites instigating this suffering. But it's allowed to continue by a whole lot of good people doing nothing about it. We're at such a critical point. So little time left to make the changes we so desperately need to make. That now I think that if you're not stepping up and fully fighting these systems that are hell bent on destroying us. then I'm sorry, but you're complicit in that destruction. I refuse to be complicit. That's why I joined Just Stop Oil in the first place. That's why I'll be at the big one this weekend. But why I'm also not stopping come Monday. Let's get real. We're not going to win this in a weekend, however much I wish we would. We need to keep the pressure on this criminal government. Day after day after day till we win. That's why I'll be slow marching with Just Stop Oil every single day till there are no new fossil fuels. It's easy f easier for anyone to get involved now because despite the Tories' best efforts, walking slowly is still legal. So there's a very low risk of arrest. You can sign up, justopoil.org, the, the website is in the chat, or come and see one of the people in orange vests at the big one. We've got a store at Parliament, stall at Parliament Square. We'll be marching, we'll be supporting XR, We'll be keeping on the pressure after this weekend. We're not going to stop the climate crisis in a weekend, so our care and concern shouldn't stop there either. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Phoebe. Um, next up, we're going to be hearing from Peter. Uh, Peter is a medical researcher from Gambia, currently working at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Peter is here to talk about the global impact of climate change that is happening right now. So please, uh, Peter. Good, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I am obviously Peter Dow from the Gambia, West Africa. Obviously, I'm a data manager. Um, fantastic and, and um, inspirational talk by Phoebe. I can concur with that because I would just go down into it, not to talk much about myself. Um, I, fr I'm, I live in the Gambia and we live on the coastal regions of the country. And one of the global, um, the global climate issue, I can already foresee it, and here's why. Because we live near the cliff of um, just by the Atlantic Ocean, and something that we have been starting to take very seriously and notice um, over the most recent years is that climate change has been driving the climate within the country in the sense where we are starting to heavily experience sea erosion, cliff erosion from torrential rain, rains that we've been starting to have at record levels, which has been evidently new in terms of research from what we are getting geographically. So that is clearly proving that climate change is directly starting to have an effect within our nation on the majority of us that are living within the coastal regions of the country. It is so sad that government and policies are ignoring and neglecting this because this is really going to affect the future for majority of us and a lot of us. The cliff in our sense here is coming so close 
and it's so evident for anybody that would notice or come around here would clearly see that in the next 10 to 15 years, probably half of our compounds would have been lost to the falling and the erosion of the cliff. So the climate aspect is something that we greatly support. We even held a planetary health um, climate conference in the Gambia in 2020 to basically inform researchers and scientists about the issue of climate. And it's a research, research segment that was kind of put to the side due to the intro introduction of COVID, but in the sense that now we're really working towards reinvigorating that aspect of research that we are doing within our institutions, as well as our neighboring um, partners. One other aspect within some, um, within some of the studies, I have been fortunate as a data manager within the institution to actually run one of the first environmental studies where we actually did air monitoring, um, which was actually done in the rural areas of the country. And to our very surprising discovery that through the effects of climate change, as Phoebe has mentioned, this famine and also suffering are starting to become very evident. For example, last year um, during the summer period, which is our actual rainy, um, rainy season, we actually had record levels of rains, which thoroughly affected some of the livelihoods, people's homes were flooded. A colleague of mine who is part of this movement um, spoke uh, previously, Abdullah, had actually mentioned that in his own home, he, his home was actually flooded. I actually had to go and help and support some of the families within there physically to actually help them with their belongings over the flooding that they had experienced. So you can clearly see that the global aspect of how climate change is affecting us from the southern part of the world is starting to really become apparent. People are suffering, people are dying, and these are all people from poor backgrounds that we even had to work together to support them with GoFundMe accounts for disaster relief. That was still not enough. Some are still suffering, some are still dying. So I really appreciate and love this initiative. Unfortunately, I'm not in the UK to support the movement um, in the upcoming weekend, but I will be in the UK at some point, hopefully around the summer, to continue to support the fight for climate change and policy driven aspects to support our agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, really appreciate that. And um, just before we move on to our final speaker, just a reminder that if you do have any questions for the Q&A section of tonight, please direct them to Q&A entries in the chat and they'll be able to pass them on and make sure that we can get to as many as possible. Uh, so now, finally, we're going to hear from Chris Packham. Uh, I'm sure many of you are fully aware who Chris is, uh, but for, for those of you who may not know or may need refreshing of Chris's achievements, uh, he is a wildlife expert, TV presenter, author, author and conservationist. And in recent years, Chris has become a central voice in environmental justice here in the UK. And we are thrilled to have him here tonight to share his journey with, with environmental activism and why it is so important that we all take action. And just as a reminder, Chris will also be speaking at an event on Saturday the 22nd. Uh, the link for this event is going to be posted into the chat. Uh, so please, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Anna, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation to uh, join the discussion. First of all, I'd like to say how inspired I've been by the speakers, for not just what they've said tonight, but what they've been doing to date, doing, actively doing. Um, I have enormous regard for those who are at the forefront of this protest. Um, I consider them to be very brave people, Sometimes they're intellectually brave. They've made that quantum leap where they know that they have to change their minds, something that we humans are not terribly good at, certainly not in a short space of time. And on other occasions, they're forsaking their freedom. They're going to jail. They're being jailed for crimes, which some of us might question the degree of criminality in, involved. So thank you very much. I, I, I applaud and support your your actions and, and I welcome your invitation to speak to you tonight and join in of course on, on the big one. I think what's interesting and telling is that we have all recognized that we need to expand our scope for effective protest because in order to instigate the change that we so desperately want we need a portfolio of means. I'm slightly embarrassed if you want to know 
um, disappointed, if you want to know, not angry that your collection of supporters don't include so many of the NGOs that I work very closely with who have a committed concern for conservation in the UK. Um, I therefore list the RSPB, the Wildlife Trust and so on and so forth. Because I know that within the ranks of those organisations, there are people who are obviously as gravely concerned about the plight that we face um, globally in terms of climate and biodiversity as those conservation projects that they so wholeheartedly support in the UK. But I'm disappointed that their leadership have not aligned this weekend to make sure that they are present at the big one. The big one, as you've heard at the very outset, is an opportunity for us all to find our feet and voices. What we're in doing, we're inviting people to come to our capital and to listen and learn and think about how we can best influence positive change, whether that is through nonviolent direct action, whether that's through throwing soup at paintings, whether that's through slow marching, whether that's through, frankly, campaigning at any other lower level. We've got to find that point where we all step up. We take one step at this point beyond our comfort zone. We might have been signing petitions, and I would argue that some petitions are valuable. They generate a sense of involvement. They build a sense of community. If they're used properly, they can generate noise and conversation and creative dialogue. But you're right. Sometimes it's all too easy to spend three minutes sticking your name in a box with a postcode. And frankly, maybe not enough happens rapidly enough. And what we've heard from our speakers tonight is that we need that rapidity because we are in deep, deep, deep shit. And we find ourselves this you know, deep in excrement at a time when we have globally, not just in the UK, managed to uh, you know, vote in a collection of governors, politicians, call them what you will, at every level. So I'm not just focusing on the UK government here. I'm talking about global governments. I'm, I'm talking about decision makers at local level. And as a classic case of this, we might just choose the recent example in the city of Plymouth in the southwest of England, where a whole load of trees were felled against the community's wishes. Now, that governing body made a catastrophic mistake. They destroyed the trees which cannot be easily replaced. They reduce the capacity for that city within the city to support biodiversity. But the most critical mistake I think they made was they entirely misjudged public opinion because the outcry was significant. They were out of touch. And our mission at this point is to bring our decision makers into touch. Now, some of them will come willingly because they will entertain the capacity to change their minds, even if it's through the nefarious reasons that they want our votes in their next poll at whatever level that is, parish, county, city, council, national government, global government, whatever it happens to be. So we can be cynical about that. But nevertheless, we just need them on board. We need them to make those changes. So I'll forgive their cynicism so long as we get a result. I'm interested in results. You know, the methodology is something that we all need to consider, but ultimately we need to be looking at the results and we need to be focusing on the bigger picture. We can't get lost down the rabbit holes. We can't get distracted or deliberately distracted by their press and their media or their lack of press and media. We need to stay very clearly focused on our mission. And that's what I like about Just Stop, Animal, uh, Just Stop Oil. That's what I like about Animal Rising. They are, you know, doing what it says on their tin. Just Stop Oil is about stopping oil exploration and exploitation. It's asking for a cessation in the granting of those licenses and the provision of those subsidies, which continue to obviously, as everyone knows, damage, critically damage our future. Just Stop Oil are not distracted by some of the things they could be distracted by, because obviously, in order for, to facilitate that transition, we need a change in the way that we produce our energy. We need investment in a green economy. We need investment in sustainable energies and sustainable energy generation. Of course we do. But 
they focus very much on one critical aim. Others can come in and support that and, and all of those things that I've just listed, listed. Animal rising, they want to transition to a plant-based future. Now, anyone who's done any research into this, anyone who's considered this, as we know, but then we might be preaching to the converted tonight, recognize that in order to secure a future for our planet's biodiversity, a future for ourselves on this planet with its limited resources, that is somewhere we need to go. We need to make that transition. And of course, there will be many changes that needs to be instigated, but animal rising are clearly focused. They're not distracted. And that's why they're taking the actions they are. And that's why I'm keen to support them. I think that we all need to keep our eye on that bigger picture and not be distracted. Stick to what we're good at. And I would argue that Just Stop Oil and Animal Rising are good at what they're doing. What we all need to do is find our place in that movement. Are you someone who, like Phoebe and like Anna, are prepared to give up their freedom to make a stand which catches global attention? Well, you may not be at that point yet, but you need to be at your next point. You can slow march with Just Stop Oil because it isn't currently illegal. Goodness knows how long it will take them to change that law. So maybe that's what you do this weekend. And if you're undecided whether to join us at the big one, then let me make this plea. Consider it like a trip to a, an art gallery, a museum, a, a library, somewhere where you can come and learn somewhere where you can fuel up on others, energy, determination, ambition, bravery, all of those parts of the human character which we revere so much. Because I know for sure that through the course of the weekend in London, I'm gonna be inspired, uplifted, comforted, reassured. You know, my anger will be suppressed. My anxiety will be suppressed because I will feel part of a community that has decided to take action. And that's what we all need to do. And what I like most critically about the big one is that it's an invitation to take action on whatever level you choose to do so. It's not like the semi-old days where the mantra was to be arrested. You can if you like, but you don't have to. And I think that what's so critical about that is that this is a time where we're taking stock, we're reappraising how we confront this, because none of us here tonight are secure that we are winning. We're making progress. Of course, we're making progress. We've seen significant progress. I would argue that what Animal Rising did at the weekend was significant progress. It got press all over the world. And despite the lunacy of the right wing press, you know, um, the fact of the matter is that they were ethically and morally right. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you might be overseas. Then unfortunately, you know, several animals were forced to give up their lives. They were killed in the name of pleasure, unnecessarily for pleasure at the weekend. And Animal Rising did a fantastic job of drawing attention to that. So please join us. Please use this opportunity to figure out how you're gonna step up how you're going to raise your voice, how you are going to make a difference at the most critical time in our planet's and species history. Because at some point in the future, you may be elderly if you're lucky, and a young person, maybe a relative of yours or someone you might care about and love, might come up and touch your knee and they might just ask you, what did you do when it really needed to count? And if you can't look down at that young person who will be living undoubtedly in a very much modified and more difficult world. If you can't look down with a clear conscience and say, I did what I could at that point, then I don't want to be you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, as always, this is such an honor to have your support. It really, it means the world to us. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, now we're going to move on to the Q&A section of this talk. So we've had a few questions come in and I'm just going to read them out and direct them to uh, just whoever may be best at answering. Uh, so the first question we've had come through is due to some severe mental health issues I'm suffering, I can't get out and take action. What can I do to help from my home? Uh, Blythe, would you like to take this one? 
Hi, yeah, I think this is a really important one because many, many people are in this situation for lots of different reasons. Um, so we, we obviously we want everyone to be able to be involved in the climate movement and any movement. Um, so um, specifically at the big one, um, there's multiple things you can do, um, notably if you to take part in the assemblies happening daily. Um, there is a web page which I, I can drop in the Zoom chat potentially in a bit and you can go and you can participate digitally um, and um, and there's many more forms of digital action that you can take via that website and I think this is absolutely crucial. Um, uh, so yeah, explore the website and um, I'm sorry that you're suffering at the moment. I'll pass on to the next question. Yeah, thank you so much, Fly. Um, it's the power of modern revolution that we are all constantly online so there is absolutely still avenues for you um, in that circumstance and um, so the next question we have is is the big one the only way to try and make big governmental change it feels like nothing is working and nothing will work how do we get through to the general public who care about the climate but do not do anything about this uh Phoebe would you like to answer this one yeah um so I don't think, like I said, I don't think that we're going to win this in this weekend. I think our hope is sustained pressure. And as Chris said, all of us stepping up to do what we feel we can do more. For many people, that will just be coming this weekend. Somebody who's maybe been involved in the climate movement, maybe they think now it's ready for me to go and get arrested or to make that step of high stakes action, which might win, which might risk going to prison. I think we all need to be doing everything we can, where we can, when we can, because they're not going to give in like that. We need pressure from all sides, from all angles to keep this going. The next one, um, Chris, if you'd like to answer this one, um, it is why haven't other conservation groups aligned themselves with the big one? Well, I wish I could give you a direct answer to that. I, I, I haven't spoken to them personally. Uh, earlier in the year, I was organising a, a smaller big one, a little one, uh, which was a walk for wildlife. It was derailed, if you'll forgive the pun, by various rail strikes. and We decided not to run it. We will do so at some point in the future. Um, uh, there was enormous anger from RSPB Wildlife Trust and National Trust. Um, they launched a hashtag, uh, Attack on Wildlife. And we. Yeah, this was through a port, you know, portfolio of concerns where government were in a position to act in properly when it came to conservation of nature in the UK. Um, they're very cautious. They're very conservative with a small C. Um, they're very dependent or appear to be very dependent on their uh, membership. They're quite corporatized on that way. Um, and I understand some of that and I'm sympathetic with that. They need to run long-term conservation projects. You, you know, they can't go bust in five minutes or there will be an enormous amount of damage done to our our biodiversity and they and they are doing everything they can. I, you know, I, I'm also supportive of all of these organisations. I just think, frankly, they need to find some more balls, frankly. And 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 if they would just ask their members whether they wanted to get involved, not direct them. If they would just send out emails and give their members a choice, then I think that would be a little bit more uh, democratic. I mean, in all honesty, um, I get a, a fair bit of abuse for supporting Just Stop Oil and Animal Rising on my social media platforms. And a lot of the uh, followers that I have are obviously people like myself who are keen supporters of those NGOs and will remain so. Um, they don't get the message yet. But what we know statistically is that we only need 25% of people to get the message. We don't need to win all of society. We don't need everyone. We need 25%. And immediately in the aftermath of that, statistically, and I'm speaking from a, this is a scientific perspective here, um, then things cascade to change very rapidly. So we don't have to worry about converting all of those people um, to a point of understanding and, demand, and, and, and aligning with us on the demands that we're making to our, our governments across the world. We just need 25%. So, yeah, I'll be behind the scenes asking those organisations to you know, to get involved. And if they haven't got the balls to get involved yet, then to at least share what we're asking with their members so that they have a, a valid choice. But rest assured, I've got to tell you that, you know, that there'll be plenty of people from the National Trust, there'll be plenty of people from the Wildlife Trust, and there will be plenty of people from the RSPB at the big one. 
Um, it's just a shame we haven't got their logos on the banner. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, um, I'll go to the next question we've had. Um, and this is one for Animal Rising, so Orla. Uh, has there been any discussion in creating long-term change following the grand national action? Uh, I think we've seen the biggest change that we've ever seen um, in Animal Rising. Um, and that is the, the public conversation that's been happening. We've never, um, certainly in my lifetime, had this level of public support um, for anything related to animal rights, um, particularly something as big as the Grand National. Um, we were on front page news of almost all major newspapers. We've had 40 to 50 live interviews, which is more We've had more press in the last week than we did in the entire year last year. Um, and this is really the beginning of something pretty immense for us anyway. Um, we saw that the engagement with the conversation was incredibly positive from the general public, um, though some disputed our tactics. I think most people could recognize that the way that we're treating animals is really not in line um, with a nation of animal lovers, with our values. And so um, bringing this question to the general public felt like a huge step in the right direction and we haven't seen anything in terms of policy yet but normally that doesn't come uh, for months down the road so I think for for us from our perspective this is the biggest win we've had yet and we're pretty stoked. Thank you so much Ola. Um, I think we have time for just one more question um, so we've had this one come in uh, which I think I'll pass to Blythe uh, from Extinction Rebellion which is I've noticed increased anti-climate change messages on social media with an alarming hostility, hostility towards any protest action. Are you expecting trolls and hecklers over the weekend? And if so, how do you plan to address this? Um, so I suppose there's all sorts of problems we could face um, and uh, we're preparing for any, uh, we've got a contingency plan for a lot of different scenarios, including this kind of possibility um in which case we would um we've got an emergency team who would deal with it and um put out a response and then stewards are prepared for that so there's all sorts of practical preparations in place for that uh yeah hopefully it won't happen thank you so much Fly. um so yeah thank you so much uh, to all of our wonderful speakers and to everyone who's come to listen this evening um i know it's been quite a difficult listen at times but a really really powerful one uh, and remember that if you're able to please join us in action and if you're unable to join the action please support us in different ways such as donating on the digital link that uh, Blythe mentioned or through social media and if, because it's just so so important to remember that if we don't do everything to stop this death project then we will lose everything. So please join us on Monday 24th at 1 p.m. in Parliament Square for a march to end fossil fuels as part of the big one. Um, and also, of course, on Friday 21st, all day we'll be marching as well with Extinction Rebellion. So yeah, once again, thank you so much for coming and I hope you all have a very lovely evening.